Welcome to the Rebel Entrepreneur Podcast. It's a takeover episode. I'm Danny from Rebel Business School Colombia, and I wanted to know how did it all started. Uncover the stories, the ups and downs of this amazing journey. So join me as I grill, paint and done again, and see what actually happens at Rebel Business School UK. The extraordinary belongs to those that create it. Rebelling against business plans and debt, rebelling against what society expects of us to build cool businesses, make money, have fun and do good. Let's create something extraordinary together. Welcome to The Rebel Entrepreneur. So, Simon and Alan, it's amazing to talk to you guys here through the episode. We have been just meeting each other here in Colombia uh, in the last weeks, and it's it's it was a hell of a of a journey of an experience. I first want to start with, like, after talking with you guys, and I get so much energy, so much confidence from you. Where does it all come from? Where do you guys find all that confidence? Coffee. <laughs> Uh, the supermarket. I, it's on the. If you go on the fourth <laughs> aisle, second shelf down, they sell it in boxes. Have you not seen that? Well, we don't have well, those we, in Colombia. Yeah. <laughs> if we could box confidence, we would have the biggest business in the world ever. Um, confidence is interesting because Simon and I talk about how the world is a different place if you feel confident in the morning. If you wake up without confidence, you're nervous to go out there. You don't want to talk to people. Just things don't happen. Whereas if you mm -hmm. wake up full of confidence and one of Simon's favorite expressions is. Uh, buy your confidence at the supermarket. No, no it isn't. spend as much time building your confidence as you do building your business is the oh, one he one. repeated me ad finitum from day one. And that's kind of what we've done. And actually like, confidence comes from a belief. Mm -hmm. and you develop a belief. I have a belief that I can learn anything. I have a belief is that if I'm given time and resource, anything is possible. I have a belief that I'm doing the right thing in helping people the way I help them. I have a belief that debt in most cases is evil. And these beliefs are what drive me and give me energy and make me want to force out into the world to change things. So I think... It all starts with your own self-belief. Okay. And obviously, when the Rebel Business School programs are running, and this is an essential part of, of the whole experience, how do you teach people? How do you uh, help them build that confidence? Or, as you are saying, like gain that belief? I've been thinking about this an awful lot. And you know what? It, it came up today. I think... I have said that that phrase, spend as much time building your confidence as you do building your business. I've said that for 10 years. But I think recently I've developed a different view. <laughs> so I'm kind of playing with some new ideas at the moment. I think, I think what I've noticed is a few things. The first thing I've noticed is that when Alan and I operate together, both of us seem to operate at a higher level of confidence. It's almost like anything is possible. Um, mm -hmm. So I think there's something there about surrounding yourself with people that have either got the skill set that you've got less of. So it almost like completes, you know, I think Alan and I have got got some overlapping skills, but we've also got some very different skills. So there's something about <laughs> that. <laughs> I don't know why you're laughing like a evil supervillain. Like we'll come back to that in a minute. Um And I guess that's the first bit is sort of finding people to hang out with that, that you can sort of your confidence kind of feeds off of their self-belief too. So there's something about that for sure. The second idea that I've been playing with is, um, uh, is that until confidence shows up, courage will do. Because if you're waiting for loads and loads of confidence before you take any action, then you'll be waiting for a long mm -hmm. time. But actually, Uh, replacing confidence with courage you know just take a deep breath and do it anyway regardless of whether you feel confident or not just put yourself out there because the, the the irony of this is that when you operate from a place where you're not feeling confident but you take some action you take a deep breath you put your brave pants on and then you go do the thing that's scaring you 
actually by spending more time out of your comfort zone, your confidence seems to grow. And that's, that's certainly an experience that I've had. And I guess the final thought is, this is my new thoughts and ideas. Every single one of us already has an abundance of confidence within us. We just have this terrible habit of concealing and hiding that confidence with thought you know and I you know those negative thoughts creep in and the lack of self-belief and we tell ourselves things like what happens if it doesn't work what if my idea fails what if everybody laughs at me and all of that stuff actually clouds the confidence the unlimited confidence that's already within us so going back to what Alan said about self-belief and like having a set of beliefs um that are confident beliefs that are empowering beliefs helps you access that deep well of confidence that already exists within you. Blimey, this is a bit deep, isn't it? Alan, I didn't mean to go this deep so early. Go on, go ahead. (laughs) Where's where we should always go because it's where the good stuff is. Um, I think the piece I would add to that and the piece that Danny said is interesting is like teaching this stuff. And I genuinely believe that you inspire confidence in other people by having confidence in yourself. Mm -hmm. And I remember doing a pitch once uh, with a lady. I was pitching to a network for a TV show that we haven't quite got over the line. Um, But she said something to me that was really interesting. She said, what else are you selling other than confidence? Because the person that's buying from you is buying your confidence that you can deliver that you can do what you say you will. And I think whether it's with a room full of 100 entrepreneurs in front of you, whether it's on a podcast with a 1,000 people, 2,000, 3,000, 8,000 last week listening, whether it's with one client looking at you going, do I want to buy your food at lunchtime? You have to inspire confidence. And that comes from you. So you've got to light this flame of confidence and energy inside yourself that you then can inspire the people around you. And it's the quickest way to get anyone to feel anything is to feel it yourself first. And I think, I mean, like what you are saying, you are like the living example of that because, and I remember last year uh, when you came for the first time to Colombia, we had already been working some months into the Revel project and setting up Revel Business School Colombia. That I mean, we really didn't quite get it at some point. It was having you here, like in person, in real life, hearing you speak, even the meetings that we had together with clients and with other people, hearing your level of confidence and how you transmit that confidence. That was like game changing for us. Like at that point. Uh, even with Fabi, we understood, like, okay, this is what Revel is about. So I absolutely think um, that, I mean, you guys not only preach it, but also, like, really do it and in real life. I am infectious. <laughs> uh, exactly. An absolute virus, Alan. A, an absolute virus that you've been planting <laughs> of yourself positivity, in. Of positivity, of confidence. Thank you for qualifying that. Uh, finally, let's be careful a good there. Virus. Yes, but th- I think that's generally what, <laughs> You need to spread. If you're spreading happiness, confidence, and I I don't know if I've ever shared this riff with you or particularly with the listeners to the podcast because it's kind of a different one, but the biggest gift you can give me is your happiness. And the biggest gift I can give you is my happiness. If I'm happy and confident and full of energy and positivity and want to make things happen, do you want to spend time with me? Mm Mm-hmm. And if you're that way for me, like it does the same and it's a positive spiral that uplifts everyone. So I would say to everyone listening to this, the biggest gift you can give the people around you is your positivity, your confidence, your energy and your happiness. Like become a beacon of happiness and confidence that infects the people around you with positivity. Follow closely by French toast, but let's start with confidence, energy, <laughs> happiness, and positivity. I love French and toast. Then yeah. French toast can come second. Uh, I like. I think just to, um, I guess to to follow on from what what you said, Danny, about your experience of uh, when Alan uh, turned up in Colombia to hang out with you guys. I think there's something about there's people that act confident, and then there's people that are confident, 
with their whole body. And I've experienced over the years, those moments of like, it's almost like a, uh, a wave of presence sort of washes over Alan's face. And it's almost like he has this internal switch that says, now I'm going to deliver confidence with my whole body. And then he looks in your eyes and says, you do believe I can make anything happen, don't you? And like in those moments of absolute certainty, I kind of look at him and go, yeah, you're right. Yeah, anything's possible. Let's get on and do it. And I think like <laughs> we all have we all have moments where confidence leaves us. And it's usually down to, well, it's always down to our thinking, whether we're conscious of it or not. But, you know, recognizing that, we are only one thought away from being supremely confident. And that, and that's something I've learned from you, Al, is that if you're going to be confident, like don't half ass it, you know, believe it with every fiber of your body, transmit it with your eyes and your customers, for example, or your coworkers or your friends or your family in those moments, they will feel invincible. And that absolutely is an incredible gift to be able to give somebody that then they can go and fulfill whatever potential they have within them. Confidence isn't just a thought in your mind. It's just, it's not like you can just sit there and think, Oh, I'm confident. You kind of can, but like, like Simon said, with confidence is everything about you. It's your tone, it's your body language. It's how pumped up you are. It's how much energy you have. It's have you eaten vegetables and salad and are you feeling good it's um have you slept well the night before it's all of these elements go and your entire body like people see me before presentations and I bounce around and I bounce around to get the energy I need to give because when my whole body is firing I have the confidence and energy to infect anyone and if there was one thing I'd want you to take Danny and everyone else to take listening to this is get yourself fired up get yourself give yourself the energy and the passion and the, the power and if you do that like you will infect the people around you and i'm i'm using that word infect on purpose because it, it's true you know when one person yawns in a group of people what mm-hmm. happens to everyone else they start yawning mhm so <laughs> exactly the same principle is true with energy confidence happiness exactly the same principle so if i come bounding in there will be people who are resistant to it don't get me wrong because they've got a lot invested in being in despair and unhappy Mm -hmm. Um, but in general you will lift the people around you and mostly people just enjoy having meetings with simon and i because we bring fun and energy and like we want to work with you just because of your positivity and it's really interesting when you get to that level I wasn't expecting to go this direction this episode, Danny. <laughs> so cool. And, and and you have given me a lot of thoughts around it's not confidence on its own. It's also the act, the presence, how you transmit it. Sometimes you can feel confident, but you really don't. I mean, you don't look confident or it's something that you have, like Simon said, to to act it and, and engage I mean, really embrace it. But I mean, amazing stuff. If you could combine confidence with focus... Have you ever been in a meeting with me, Danny, where I like truly focus on you and what's going on? Mm -hmm. What does that do? It makes you look very into the meeting, very interested, like with all your intention on it. And what's the impact of that? How does that, what does that, what's next? you, You care, you care. And this is important. And that's one of the number one things that will drive your business is you care about the people you're meeting, the customers and everyone like caring and people can feel that intention. They can feel confidence. They can feel caring and all of that. Anyway, I will let you ask your next question and stop drumming on about that stuff. I I, I know you guys, you guys have talked um, about the history of rail and, 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 but I want to know, like, um, was rail your first successful business? It wasn't my first successful business and it like I had many failures on the way, which we can talk about another time, but I built a fairly successful corporate training business Mm -hmm. and I landed Microsoft and I did work for Pepsi and I did all sorts of corporate training courses and that actually the corporate training course business built the money up that I was then able to say, Simon, I'm earning enough money, come back and help me run Rebel Business School. 
and let's get that going. Um, and I think my corporate training business was my first properly successful business. I'd had many failures beforehand, but that was my first successful business. Landing Microsoft as a client was game changing. Um, that day, <laughs> that day I felt successful. So go that was a reasonable win. Yeah, I think it was a reasonable win. <laughs> Yeah, it's a reasonable win, landing a global business. But not only that, this is my favourite sentence that Alan doesn't normally say, but I say to everybody, or in those days, I used to tell everybody that he used to teach senior executives at Microsoft on how to use PowerPoint properly. I thought that was absolutely <laughs> hilarious. It always makes me laugh. Um, I guess I, for me, it was a slightly different journey. I think I spent more time making money successfully as a freelancer without necessarily building a successful business and I kind of, I came in and out of running my own business a number of times I had some success on a couple of things like there was a uh, a website business that sustained me for a couple of years but I described that as not successful because I didn't wake up in the morning absolutely pumped to do it like success doesn't necessarily mean the money stuff it doesn't necessarily mean being able to sustain the same thing actually like waking up in the morning going, wow, not only am I making good money, not only do I feel like we're making progress, but we're actually helping hundreds of people every month to make changes in their lives. And I think like having multiple success criteria, that was, that was, Rebel certainly is my first experience of that. I think I learned some business successes by being a senior player in small organizations, but Rebel was certainly the one that I could go, that's something that I own with Alan and we've made this happen ourselves. Okay. So, so, so cool, Simon, because yeah, I mean, it's also a whole learning experience uh, to try to understand what is success now. Success is uh, some of those words that we are hard to define. And so people have so different criteria. I think it's different for everyone, and that's the fascinating bit. The sentence I repeat on the podcast is the extraordinary belongs to those that create it. The thing that I try to say as well is, like, my version of extraordinary is different to Simon's, mm -hmm. and Simon's version of extraordinary is different to Danny's. Everyone has their own version of extraordinary, so you have to decide what extraordinary is, and then you have to go out and build it. And, mm -hmm. yeah, like, an extraordinary business like I had an extraordinary business with the training company because I was pumped. I loved running those courses for Microsoft. They would hire me. I, they were two day courses and they would put six to eight people in a room with me for two days oh, and they God. would come out slightly differently. <laughs> um, and I love that. And I was paid, I was paid like 2000 pounds plus per course. And I, they loved the course. I got huge like feedback that they loved the course, it had massive impact in their business. I earned good money. Like everything about that particular thing was a success for me. Um, and I think, yeah, working out what success means to you for a business is different for all of us. Because some people's success is about scaling your business to earn millions. That doesn't equal success for me. I mm -hmm. I don't want that. I wanted the coolest possible business that could get me to FI and help people like that, like have fun, cool stuff, cool projects. Simon, and I always spoke about let's, what cool projects can we do? Oh, let's go to Columbia and help someone set up a business school. That's a bit weird and cool. Um, <laughs> but that's what it was all about was earning good money, doing cool stuff and helping people. Okay. And my, my next question is, one that I get a lot in Colombia. And <laughs> obviously, you know, Colombia, uh, you have been here. There's a lot of universities, a lot of public uh, entities, government um, that promote and have entrepreneurship programs. And I often get this question and is what makes Revel awesome and what makes it, what makes it different from all the traditional entrepreneurship programs that are out there? Simon, what makes Rebel different? Uh, this is the bit where I don't talk about French toast, isn't it? Yeah, right. Please. So what <laughs> What makes it different? You know, oh man. I've said, I've said so many different versions of this over the years. And I think fundamentally for me, 
that most entrepreneurship programs start with the risks. They start with, if you need, if you've got a business idea and you want to make money, first you need to go and get money because it takes money to launch a business. That's the traditional view. And I had a room full of people today uh, in central London in the UK, and it was exactly the same thing. I asked the same question of everybody in the room, and they said, well, you need money to start a business, don't you? And that means you either need to get a loan, or if you're fortunate enough to have money in the bank, you go and spend your own money and you waste your cash. That's And, and then the next piece of this jigsaw is that you then have to write a business plan, because that makes sense, doesn't it? If you're going to launch a business, you need to plan it. And I think the fundamental difference between the rebel school and that approach is that instead of it being based in risk and thinking about money and planning and all that sort of stuff, it's based in practical. Like what are the actual things that you need to start with? How do you start a business? Not only get it off the ground and build it, but but do that with spending either zero or very little money to make it happen. That, that to me is so empowering. And I think business is a closed door for so many people because of the reliance on funding and business plans. It makes starting a business inaccessible to, to thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people all over the world say they can't start a business because of that. And I think the fundamental difference for us is the Rebel School said, we'll see about that. And we've been in, we've like nearly 20,000 people have been through our courses in seven different countries, most recently and most proudly what you've been doing in Colombia and spreading that message as an alternative. That's not to say there's things wrong with the with necessarily with those programs. There's something for everybody out there. But Rebel School is bringing this opportunity to people for whom it wouldn't be there if there was only those traditional programs out there. Maybe you've got a different view, Al. What do you think? No, I think well, I have a couple of ideas and it definitely is. I think if I could summarize what Simon says, the traditional programs look at everything that could go wrong when you're starting a business. And we look at everything that could go right. And then we try and avoid borrowing money and do zero risk experiments and get to the first sale. So in a traditional entrepreneurship program, like they don't even talk about making a real sale, whereas our courses are two weeks long and 40% of people have made a sale before the end of the course. Now that's the bit that makes it. It's like, oh, wow, it's possible. I have 20 pounds or 50,000 Colombian pesos in my hand. I've just made that. And there you get the self-belief and the confidence that inspires people to get going. Um, one piece I would add, which like I'd never really thought of, there's a big French business school called HEC Paris that has licensed the rebel business school model to teach in the suburbs of Paris. And it's incredible what they're doing. And their feedback was actually, it was, they used a very fancy word from academia to say our pedagogy, our way of teaching and like I stand up in front of an audience and we run exercises, everyone laughs, we have fun, we inspire confidence. If you think, if I said the words business school to people, the first thing they think of is people in suits at desks sat down with spreadsheets. Like it's boring, 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 boring. And business isn't boring. Business is anything but boring. It's a roller coaster of ups and downs of excitement. And so let's experience that together in the course not some fake world of spreadsheets where you never have to go out and sell or pitch or touch a customer. Like let's live that. So the exercises, the way we teach it, like you just won't experience anything like it at a traditional business school course until you sit in front of Simon and I, and we stare at you and ask you to do something bizarre and strange and put you outside of your comfort zone, but look after you. And, and, and it's something that we get in Colombia a lot, like the general notion that if it's not a university or a, or a government program, then it's it's strange, like a strange thing, like what, what is that? And I'm going to connect that to, to, to something that always um, interests me a lot, Alan, and is that you didn't go to university. And well, you could say this, or people would normally think that that's an obstacle when building a business. 
even and more importantly one that is about education but i think it's actually the opposite like it's it may be the best thing that you that happened to you is not going to university so that you could build this business what what do you think this is my i think it's probably my biggest blessing um <laughs> but that sounds strange so actually i've never had it where it's really caused me a problem and people always say like oh do you not need qualifications do you not need this do you not need that like when I, Microsoft never asked for my degree certificate when I won them as a customer, I teach on the Henley Business School MBA. Don't tell them. They've never asked for my degree certificate. They've never asked. Like, no one's ever asked. I just went out and did it. And actually, like, my thinking comes from building businesses and practical stuff and how do you actually make it work and my own self-development and my own learning. And not having a degree has never stopped me. I just enter with huge confidence saying, I believe I can do this. And if I can infect the people around me with confidence, they don't ask, do you have a degree or do you do this? Actually, it was interesting. The only time they ask if you have a degree is when they don't feel confident and they want to prove that you can do the job. They don't need the piece of paper if they feel like you're going to deliver what you're going to deliver. And it's never stopped me doing anything. I don't even think about it. I just want to make things happen. Simon, what are you thinking? Oh, I don't have a degree either. Um, and it, I, I think two things came to me, Alan. The first thing, uh, it doesn't matter what you know. And there's nothing there's nothing wrong with the other world. Like both worlds are valid, but there's some people thrive in academia. Other people thrive in, in practical stuff. It doesn't matter. Like when it comes to entrepreneurship, it doesn't matter what theories, you know, what business models, you know, what matters is what you can do and what you can make happen. So I think it's a, it's an absolute superpower if you've operated. And, and I mean this respectfully, but in the real world of business, you've looked at the eyes of a customer, they've turned you down, they've told you that your product or service won't work, and you've refined your pitch, you've worked out how to sell, so that we then we're better able to stand in front of an audience and say to them, look in the whites of my eyes, I'm going to tell you what works and what doesn't, but don't take my word for it, I'm going to create the conditions where you can try it for yourself now. Turn to the person next to you and sell them the, the thing that you've got in front of you based on the information that you've just learned. So it's very real time and it's very practical. And that only comes from one place and that comes from experience. Like, and if, you, if you're learning how to run your own business, where do, you, like, where do you want my experience to come from? Do you want it to come from five years of reading about it or do you want it to come from five years at the point of engagement, you know, business is a contact sport. You need us, the three of us, you need us having real experience of pitching to clients, real experience of solving problems, real experience of marketing so that we can then pass that knowledge and information on to people because they can do something with it immediately. And I think that's my experience of this stuff. Um, the second thing that came to me out, just as you were saying about being asked for your qualifications was, um, the only time I remember us being asked for qualifications, and I've worked with senior leaders in some of the world's most famous companies, Thomson Reuters, uh, Burberry, The Body Shop, British Airways, uh, Virgin, and all these companies, the only time I've ever been asked, we've ever been asked for our qualifications is from a competitor that was scared that we were running business courses on their mm -hmm. patch. And they, they wanted, do you remember, they wanted to, down in uh, the West Country, Sveddy. they wanted to see yeah, our, what in the UK, there was something called a Sveddy education, uh, um, a Sveddy accreditation for business advisors and business coaches and enterprise coaches. And they asked for that. And I said, oh, that's okay. I've actually got that stuff, but it's not worth the paper it's written on, just so you know. <laughs> it's interesting. Like, I think now I would have the confidence to ask back, have you ever run a business? <laughs> yeah, and then we paused more... and stared at them I was a little bit scared at that stage uh, but they were just trying to discredit us and that's really interesting that when you're launching something new you're challenging the status quo you're going out there people will try and discredit you because they're scared 
I remember going to one pitch in uh, a place called Dover and I delivered my pitch. It went really well. And then there was a lady on off the lady. She actually like right at the end of my pitch, she started to attack me from the sidelines. And I didn't really understand why she said, Oh, this is really interesting. The young people I work with, they just look at you and they go, you're a wanker, aren't you? <laughs> and I was thinking, what? Where's this coming from? And it's like, well, I've run lots of businesses. I'm sure I can connect with long pe young people. And I moved on and I actually found out afterwards that she was also applying for funding from the same place. And she was worried I was going to take her funding. And that's why she attacked me. So exactly. a lot of the times it will come from the people. It's not the people you want to actually help. It will come from other ways and you will get attacked if you're not getting no's if you're not getting people throwing stones at you you're not really trying hard enough so let's get <laughs> out there let's make things happen and have confidence and self-belief that you're doing the right thing and if you don't then change guys and you know when when you are running a business and when you are starting a business there's a point where things start working out or a point where you get more convinced about it you get the extra boost of, of, of confidence was there was there a point for rebel business school that you felt that okay finally this is the thing we were looking for this is the type of business this is, this was the the life project that we wanted to create was there a certain point or is something that it's built upon the whole journey you get a new one of those points every year i think like it's not a a one and done. I don't think it ever is. I remember one of the first ones. Um, I used Twitter to find someone who was running a housing association in London. Her name was Andrea. She was lovely. We made friends about coffee. She invited me in. She like that was the f she bought the first big, big, big. It, at the time it was pop up business school, Rebel Business School, and I remember doing it in East London. We moved venue every other day. We had a hundred plus people packed into tiny rooms. It was crazy. And I just remember thinking, this is it. Like, this is what I want to do. And I was doing all things. Was like, we were taking people out the back. I was running the course. Someone else was filming them so that it would be on YouTube pitching their product. We were doing all crazy things. We'd go to the market. They'd have stands. Like, it was just so much fun. And it was crazy. And I remember thinking, this is... I just need to sell more of these. This is it. I love doing this. I love helping people. But I think that happens again and again and again uh, until it doesn't. I, I was smiling Why to not? myself because I th thought it meant every week. You know, when you said, oh, you get a new <laughs> one of those points every year. I went, oh, no, no, that happens every week. And it feels like um, it feels... Do you ever play that? Do you ever play that game when you were kids in Colombia? We did it in the UK, which is like one potato, two potato, and then you put your hands on top of each other's hands like this. Or well, you sometimes yeah, you do yeah. it with you know, and you keep building and building. I think I think as soon as you're laying that first sale and you're delivering that thing, you're already thinking about what the next one is and the next one is and the next one is. So it's more of a it's more of a constant course of action whilst solving problems at pace rather than a feeling of oh yeah this is it because it's like we've won some major projects recently and you know like it really is game-changing projects like it's next level stuff for us uh but it to me it doesn't feel any different from the first sale it feels like oh it's the next iteration of what we've created um how the hell am I going to deliver this okay, well, I've got some resources here. Maybe we'll have to find some other ways of doing this, some other ways of doing that. It's just the same thing. It's just the same thing over and over again, but with the stakes slightly higher each time, I think. And it's quite interesting. I think a good business in some ways is very boring because you win the business, you do the business, you get a good result, and then you do it again. Yeah. Um, and actually where people are searching for excitement, it messes up your business. And partly I've over the years started, yeah, there's Simon pointing at himself going, I try to do new things and I do sometimes as well, but I try and always take us back to the engine 
the engine of Rebel Business School is running the courses, helping people, doing things. And that's what we need to do. That's the engine that creates the profits and builds the business. And really, if you can build a really successful, boring business that makes you happy and then do some cool stuff around it, that's perfect. Yeah, I, I, I have given a lot of thought on that and I use the, an analogy with the board game Monopoly. And it's that part, oh. that point in Monopoly when you are not doing well, when everything can go wrong and you can get bar bankrupt and then you pass everything and you become rich. <laughs> and Alan has his Monopoly game there. <laughs> and you get, at this point, <laughs> you get at this point where, I mean, you're already rich and you're going to win and it's boring because all the adrenaline of being uh, very close and in a very risky way, but it's, it's, it's fun, like how business relates to that. And I, I really want to ask this question, and it's a nerdy one, but you guys know that I'm also a teacher, and I love uh, being a teacher, like the challenge of, uh, of inspiring and being a teacher. And when you are teaching entrepreneurship, like that's a whole, a whole uh, different type of challenge because entrepreneurship is not much about knowledge, how mo much things in academia are, but it's more about skills and attitude. So my question is, how do you teach an attitude to someone? Either be confident, either be like go there and take a risk or don't worry about the risk, but go and execute. How do you teach an attitude that is not something that you learn? It's not learning two plus two. It's learning a whole attitude. Uh, my version of this is dive into the audience and demonstrate it with humor and care because you can't use humor without care because then you're just bullying people you have to use humor with care and love and so i have many versions of this one is like like let's say we're selling on twitter i get up twitter and i go okay so let's imagine we're selling to these customers how do we find them and the audience shouts stuff out and then i gently like laugh at their answers but mainly after i've typed them in so they'll say like oh you need to search for this so i type it in and show what comes up and i go is that a good place to start And they all laugh and then we come up with another answer and then we put the next answer in and the next answer in. And then eventually they're going, oh, okay, I get it now. I just need to search directly for my customer. And then I go, okay, so now we found the customer. What do you say to them? And someone will immediately say, uh, would you like to buy my product? So then I say, okay, let's do a live demo of that in the room. And I go straight up to someone in the course, stare them in the eyes from about one inch away and go, would you like to buy my stuff? And they look a bit scared <laughs> and they look a bit threatened. I'm like, is that a good way to approach people to sell stuff? And everyone laughs and we talk, okay, so how do you connect? How do you find things? So, so it's, it's the, the humor, the, this and the engagement. And practical life exercise, no? like doing it there, doing a real not reading it from a book nor doing an no. exercise it's very practical let's sell together now and then they see me actually starting to type their messages ready to send to live human beings over the other side of the country and they're like are you really going to send that I was like well that's what you told me to send <laughs> then they look a bit panicked and we explore it and then we come up with another version and I hit send anyway and they're like you can't say that to them I'm like, well I just did you told me to uh And it, it's really fun and it's engaging. And then they start to see, okay, well, that person never responded. Maybe that wasn't a good way to approach them. That one did get a response. Maybe we should try that more. And it's that live interaction and the fun and the humor. But I think it's the humor. I think it's the engagement and the fun and the joking that brings it to life. And then people realize sometimes we do stupid stuff, Danny. I do. I'm like, I send messages and I'm like, you shouldn't have said it that way. But if I'm like doing with Simon and we're engaging, and we're laughing about what we're doing, how we're saying it, it just has a different feeling. So I think the practical live examples that I gently joke about get people to realize a completely different way of doing it and a completely different attitude of positivity. It's, it, it's more, it's sort of like if humor opens a door that all, that it's not there all, already open not like it, it it builds on the confidence but also on the trust of people no it's it's very interesting what what humors what humor makes people do no if you're laughing you're learning and i am very very funny <laughs> <laughs> 
Is that funny, funny, ha ha clown or funny, funny, weird? <laughs> You're going all good fellas on me. I think like one of the things that, uh, in fact, it's been happening today. It's very front of mind today. I've got a real mixed audience of people. I've got a bunch of people that are from their, you know, service providers, helping people in the community. They're sat in the room. I've got these the two coolest lads, two brothers, the two coolest lads that you could possibly find in London. I've got a musician. I've got a couple of middle-aged women. I've got a big guy at the back who sat with his arms folded, staring at me the whole time. It's such a mix of people. But if I don't get them, if I don't get them open-minded, I could give them the best business strategy in the world, but they ain't going to follow it. So there's a whole bunch of things going on. I think I think they've absolutely got to trust us first. And I think humor is a really lovely way of breaking down those barriers, softening people up, getting them open-minded. But then we're backing up that humor with uh, a style of delivery, which keeps them hooked for six hours a day, every day for two weeks. Mm -hmm. We're backing it up with a, a, a torrent of stories. I mean, there are so many stories that we've all got between us that let me tell you a story. Now let me demonstrate this live in front of you. And I'm giving you the tools right now for you to try it yourself. Don't take my word for it. We're doing it right now, everybody. I think there's lots of things within that, but I, I agree with you, Alan. I think my, my secret weapon is humor. If I can get people laughing early and it, it, quite often it's quite self-deprecating. You know, we kind of go, here's mm -hmm. something dumb I did. Let me show you the dumbest <laughs> thing that I did on YouTube in 2009. And now I'm going to ask you questions. Why is it that this incredible idea, why is it that since 2009, it's got 98 views? I mean, that's quite spectacular, that is. I mean, you know, and, and having that kind of fun with people. So it, when we've had people deliver some of our content over the years, when they come from a place of success, the audience kind of reject them. They go, you're not really like me. I don't think, you know, and it's almost like people come across as too boastful and it just doesn't land. So there's some, there's, there's a very complex set of things going on here. Um, but yeah, what do you make of that, Al? I do like the bit about success and failure. And I actually think you need a combination of both because you're actually saying, look, I've been where everyone is. I've tried all the stuff you're thinking. And I, I think I've done this with you, Danny, sometimes as well. It's like, okay, you want to do that. Here's what happened to me. Go ahead and try it and see what happens. Uh, and then I go, when I did this, this is what actually worked to get to the next step. So I think having both elements of I have tried and failed and Absolutely. the other side and most of the times I'm, sur I, I'm surprised and I get back to you like, Alan, it happened exactly as you mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> I, I only know that because I've done it like 15 times. I've tried it. Um, the interesting bit is it happens exactly the same in Colombia as it does in the UK, in America, in everywhere else we've tried this, which I found fascinating how much people are people the world over. <laughs> and Simon... Um, Recently, well, Alan, as some people know, left the UK to live as a nomad, and you are, and you are now like the captain of the ship. So, do you miss Alan? Alan, who? <laughs> 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 yeah. Of course, I do. That's right, Alan. There is only one Alan. <laughs> I think that's what you were saying with that, wasn't it? There's only one Alan Donegan. I think, like, um, I think it's really interesting because. Uh, like I said, right at the start of this podcast, Alan and I have a similar but also very different skill set. And we've said since since we first you know ran our first very very first business project together, uh, a combination of the two of us, we are we feel in absolutely invincible together. I absolutely miss him, and I tell you, one of the most annoying things about being friends and business partner with Alan, like I could I could sit rocking gently in the corner of my hotel room as I have been doing for the last hour and a half this evening trying to figure something out and then I'll ring Alan or send Alan a text message or a voice note or something we tend to communicate a lot by voice notes when we're in different time zones and his ability to have clarity on something I really miss I think it like when Alan left it was a good time for both of us because he was starting a new chapter of his life and it was also it was also felt like the moment where I wanted to 
steer the ship for a bit. This conversation this evening has made me realise I'm not the right person to do it for much longer because I'm getting to that point where, yeah, we're solving a few problems now. Let's mix it up and do something crazy. This is like the worst Don't possible thing that up. we can do. No! I know. You Let's come do to me and go... <laughs> Let's get to Morocco. I want to make money. Let's do this. Part, I'm like, no. That's the part of the monopoly no. that he's too rich <laughs> yeah. and wants to. <sighs> yeah, exactly. Uh, We're going around the monopoly board, but I'm staring at the chance cards. I'm going, let's turn all the chance <laughs> cards over and see what happens just to make life oh, more no. interesting. The extraordinary is built in the mundane. Let's do the mundane, simple stuff. Go around the board, collect the 200, invest in a property, generate returns, keep doing it until we've reached financial independence, until we've reached a goal. Like The extraordinary is built in the mundane. And that realization has enabled me to go, well, okay, if I want to build like a successful blog, I just need to sit down and write every day. If I want to write a book, I just need to write 500 words a day, whatever it is. And it's not sexy. It's not cool. It's just me and a laptop and I do it. It's really fascinating. The extraordinary is built in the mundane. So let's stop trying to have excitement in life. Like go get your excitement somewhere else. Go skydiving. Go do something else, Simon. Get some excitement Skydiving. Whatever you do, I don't know what makes you excited. Well, actually, why would I throw anyway, myself let's not go a there. perfectly serviceable aeroplane, Alan? Yeah, let's not talk <laughs> we, about what excites we know that Simon. Hot, hot cocoa with cheese, with cheese doesn't make him excited. No, that's a, <laughs> so for everyone out there, there's a very strange thing in Colombia called onces, uh, elevenses, uh, which British people will understand, elevenses. But in Colombia, they have hot chocolate with cheese in it. Like you literally get a block of cheese, you put in the hot chocolate it's very strange but simon wouldn't try it close minded we just didn't have the opportunity that was all he he doesn't want that level of excitement he doesn't want that level of excitement the columbia office and i love it (laughs) but before we talk about columbia guys you last year you won the queen's award for the enterprise for promoting opportunity I, i mean i know that to some extent you being very british and alan being very British, but something not very connected with the British traditional part. Um, what does that? Di- I mean, is it what does it mean for the for the business, but or also for you individually? Uh, for me, it actually, it's really interesting sharing the Queen's Award with our international partners because it. it I think, you know, the Queen is obviously such a famous and global brand. It seems to hold more weight overseas than it does here or at least I thought that was the case uh, and then we got introduced to one of our one of our sponsors one of our clients in London we've we've just kicked off a new project somebody that came along to the Queen's Award presentation was the senior guy from that London Borough Council and he interrupted the start of the meeting in front of about 15 of his senior colleagues right at the start of this project. This is about a month ago. Uh, And he said, before we start this meeting, I just want to let you know of the caliber of organization that we're dealing with here. The Rebel School have won a Queen's Award for promoting enterprise and opportunity. They're one of only 18 organizations to win that particular award in the last two years. And I need everyone in in this call to understand that before we move forward, because this is the top business award that you can win in the UK. And that was one of those moments where I went, is he talking about us? <laughs> like, it's, I suddenly <laughs> you realized, and me. Yeah, I know. And it, the same thing happened, Alan. Do you remember when that, that lovely woman who was the deputy Lord Lieutenant for Camden Borough in mm-hmm. central London, when she, and you were dialing in from Mexican beach somewhere or something for that, for that thing and she started reading out the words of the queen mm. and what this thing meant and up until that moment it felt like oh this is another achievement for us yeah. yeah it's really cool it's another achievement for us it makes really good business sense it's really lovely for the team it's really lovely for the clients it's really lovely for some of our participants to come along and share this with us and as she started reading out the words like my face dropped and I kind of went mm. Oh, wow. And I could feel a little, I feel a bit emotional talking about it now because suddenly I realized that this is not 
just another achievement. It's actually a massive deal, but I didn't realise it until they knightly handed it over. Even when we went to Windsor Castle and we did the whole, you know, fancy reception in these very grand halls of the UK, that didn't connect with me at all. It felt a little bit like pomp and ceremony. It didn't feel real. It felt like it was a fake kind of networking event. I felt really uncomfortable there, not least the fact that I was in a suit. I mean, I haven't worn a suit since 2012. (laughs) And let's not talk about what happened after that. But anyway, um, it felt very uncomfortable. But the actual thing itself, when it happened, it was incredibly special, incredibly special. And we're massively, massively grateful. Yeah, I think that I haven't actually managed to like the feeling of winning the queen's award that was the night it hit i think what i want to use it for is to open doors to be able to help more people that's what i want to use it for and go look we've got a queen's award i haven't actually quite managed to to do that i don't think in the same way and i don't know how to do it from like a place of myself doing it without the arrogance and sometimes you, it's the arrogance of saying, look, we're a Queen's Award business. You should listen to us. We're very special. <laughs> um, like, it just doesn't connect with me. And I kind of, but then like one of the things I realized way back when, when we first ran our courses and like some of the people I ran pop-up business school to the start with, we had this expression of um, blow your own trumpet because no one else is going to blow it for you. And it sounds a bit weird, but we'd run this amazing course and then we'd done all this work supporting entrepreneurs afterwards, but we never told the client what we were doing. And then they were actually disappointed with the service we'd given. Mm. And I'm like, how can you be disappointed? Look at all what we've done. And it's because we didn't tell them. And I don't think we blow our own trumpets enough. And this for everyone out there blow your own trumpet like you Mm -hmm. you don't tell people what you're doing i'm not good at it like the britishness in me i hate it i'm trying to stamp it out but the like britishness of not really what a headline very i don't know stamp out the britishness but you know what i mean it's that like it's difficult in england to shout about what you're doing in other cultures it's far easier and i'd Mm -hmm. say to everyone out there get over it blow your own trumpet you do not win wards you do not enter Enter yourself for awards. Put yourself out there. Blow your own trumpet. Be proud. This is one I've not fixed for myself. So, like, but do it. Do it anyway. You have to. Queen's Award winner says he's stamping out his Britishness. I can see the headlines. <laughs> I'm going to ring our PR team. Oh, no. Did I actually just say that? That's like one of those moments yep. in the meeting, Simon, where they go, did Alan just say that? <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say that. Well, I think entrepreneurs, sometimes because they are also so used to failure or to failing. And I mean, if you get like, if you get really affected by failure and you fail a lot, then you'll have to start building some sort of defensive mechanism so that failures don't affect you that much. The problem is that when you start doing successes, it also affects, I think, that way because you don't celebrate successes that much. So it's like, I mean, reaching that balance of, okay, I'm not getting myself. Obviously, failure affects you, but also uh, I want to enjoy to celebrate my successes. Yeah, give yourself 10 minutes. If you fail, you have 10 minutes to like be annoyed and then like feel it because you've got to feel it Mm -hmm. and then get on to the next thing. Because if you don't feel the failure, you won't feel the success, which Mm -hmm. I think is what Danny's saying. So, yeah, just feel it and then let's move on. Yeah. And guys, recently, well, I had the most amazing experience of having you guys, both of them, both of you in person here in Colombia. We were in Bogota. We went to Armenia, to the coffee area, and we had such an amazing time. Um, At some point, did you imagine that was possible? Like Rebel Colombia, Rebel uh, a possible new surprise that we have for you. No, uh, it's a ridiculous sentence, Danny. But like, I love saying it to people because they stare at me. Like in the UK, they just look at me like, what? Yeah, what? Did he just say you're lo- you've launched in Colombia? And I, the way that I say say to people, I say, look, we've got um, we've got operations running a number of different countries, but we're really proud of the fact that we've that we've launched in uh, the next obvious place to go. And they go, where was that? And I said, Colombia. 
They go, what? <laughs> Columbia? <laughs> And I think oh, yeah. I just want to acknowledge Wait. what you've done, Danny. I, I think it's this is really important for me because uh, in March 2020, and like I said this a few times, and I know Alan has too, in March 2020, when the first lockdown happened in the UK, such a huge chunk of our business evaporated within two hours. I mean, it really was quite a scary time. Um, mm-hmm. But... Okay, so we managed to figure out how to put ourselves online like lots of businesses did. We figured that out. We ran our first ever full online course in May of 2020. Six months later, you launched the first course in the middle of a pandemic in central Bogota in a different language, in a different continent. Like, how is that even possible, Danny? Did you ever think that was possible? I want to ping this question back at you, my friend. (laughs) <laughs> no, definitely it was. I mean, I look back at that, at that program, the one we did, the the first one here in Bogota that you mentioned, and I'm also like, how the hell we did, we did, we achieved doing that. I mean, just the fact of like not only translating from English to Spanish, but translating the methodology, translating the feeling, uh, the what the philosophy behind it. That was so crazy, really. Yeah, and credit to you. What do you think, Al? Well, I think we're planning an episode where we're going to interview Danny about the experience of setting up Rebel Business School in another Mm -hmm. country because I'm actually fascinated to find out how it was because we have had a bunch of failures, successes, mixed results translating like Rebel Business School to other countries. And I think mainly it's to do with the people and how we've worked. Um, but it's really interesting because you know, we've launched in Morocco, in France, in New Zealand. We've had failed attempts in Canada. We've had failed attempts in America. But a successful, a hugely successful attempt in Colombia. So it'll be really interesting to, to, to delve into that. And uh, I promise everyone listening, we've got that episode coming up. Um, and before we wrap up with the closing thoughts and remarks, Danny, what other questions do you have for us before we sort of wrap this podcast up today? I had a couple of extra ones, uh, a little bit more out of the table and uh, more cool questions about, like, I mean, you have been helping thousands of people, but I'm sure there's been a couple uh, of crazy participants in the history of the world in the school or some anecdotes that you might want sh- want to share with us about strange things, something strange that happened. But the one that comes to mind immediately when you say that is we ran an event in Birmingham and this amazing guy came in. Uh, he sat at the back for the first day and fell asleep <laughs> and he just slept through the workshop and then left. And then he came back and then we had a bit more of a chat to him and he had one of those tear marks, you know, the tear tattoos. Mm -hmm. And he told us stories of being in prison and what he was doing. And then I start to ask, so what business are you launching? And he wanted to uh, launch an escorting business. Oh, wow. So then I'm there scratching my head going, I have said to everyone, you can make money doing anything. (laughs) <laughs> and I'm going, is escorting legal in the UK? What is this? Can, Henry, can you Google that? Like, tell me what this is. And it was the most unbelievable experience. And I'm trying to come from a place of desperately trying to help uh, what it is. But it was a it was a fascinating experience. I never expected to be Googling that stuff. Um, you know, and my search history is a little bit strange, but let's not go there. Um, and we've had like, we've had every... I think the people who are most memorable to me are the ones who open up and actually ask for help. Mm -hmm. There's this incredible lady called Linda who turned up at a workshop and I think it was day three at lunchtime. She was in tears. I'm like, what's going on? And she said, I'm going to be evicted by my landlord by tonight. Hmm. And then I'm going into, okay, how do we stop you getting evicted? And I'm ringing the housing association contacts I've had, and we're trying to get her furniture in to sell it and raise money and do this and do that. And like, she actually opened up and the only way I can help people if they open up and tell me what's going on. And, you know, five years later, she has a hugely successful business. She lives in the same house. Like she's one of my favorite success stories. 
Mm-hmm. But like, there's those are the ones that stand out to me. Like, there are the weird and the crazy and the amazing, and the people who genuinely open up. Those yeah. are the ones I love. So cool. And you, Simon? Any? It can be memories. It can be uh, crazy stuff. I mean, some cool memories. It's a lovely question. Have. Danny, my head's gone in all sorts of different directions. Just before I answer, Alan, you just reminded me of the reason why I I get so... I kind of go off the deep end when somebody says, yeah, we already do what you do, because there's not a single business school in the UK that would know what to do with that woman that you helped that time, Alan. Like, you literally no. changed that woman's life by what you did. And I think that those moments uh, massively inspire me. One of our... Um, you, one of our courses that we ran in the southeast of the UK in Kent, we had this incredible woman called Sonia. She's really talented at healthy food cooking. She spent her last cash that she had in her bank account. She was literally down to her last few pounds. She spent it on a bus fare so that she could get to our course. Mm-hmm. And the reason that she did that was because she pre-sold um, some food Uh, to some of the participants and the first person to buy a product from her was you, Alan. Yep. And I think I bought her lunch. I was like, you're serving healthy salads. I'm in. Yeah. And that, that uh, Sonia is again, for similar reasons is one of my most favorite participants because she is fought from nothing. And we've given her the tools, the information that she needs, the inspiration and, and, you know, she's had it tough, but she's doing so well at the moment. I offered her money three weeks ago. I said, Sonia, we're running an event. I'm really sorry it's short notice, but we need some catering. Can you come and can you come and provide some food for our event? She said, I'd absolutely love to, but I'm really sorry I'm too busy. Like, that's why we do what we do. <laughs> yes. Like, she turned me down. Yes. Yeah. And it made me so proud. Yes. Yeah, I was so proud of her. Um, the other one that sprung to mind... Um, so I was running a course in Manchester in the northwest of the UK with Jack and it felt to me like the most boring course that we'd ever run. The people were nice enough, but there was no, there didn't seem to be anything vibrant happening and I couldn't quite put my finger on why I was giving it all my energy. Is it the room? Is it the setup? Is this, is it the community? Is there something missing here? And I turned to Jack and I said, Jack, this is the quietest course we've ever run. Isn't it quiet? And then I would say within about 15 minutes, a guy had passed out at the back of the room, an ambulance arrived, someone else kicked off in the room. And it was just the most bizarre thing that happened. So after that moment, the word quiet is banned at the rebel school. No one's allowed to say that it's quiet. (laughs) He was okay, by the way, just to let you know, he did make a full recovery, everybody. It was only a minor heart attack. And I think just one thing I'd like to add at the end is, Something I say regularly is, I don't actually care if you start a business. I just want to help you make progress, whatever that is to you. And I think that's one of the main differences with our focus is Mm -hmm. like people come to us with, I'm going to get evicted or this is going to happen or that's going to happen. Like, let's dive in. And this comes from this belief of we can figure anything out if we do it together. Mm -hmm. And I actually love it because it gives me a challenge on like, I've got to help this person. Like, how do we do this? Jack, build a website. Henry, do this. I'll sell it. Do this. And then we pull together some kind of magic solution that may or may not work, but it inspires them to do something different that does work and they actually make progress. So I, d- I genuinely don't care if you're listening to this podcast. I do not care if you build a business. I care if you make progress towards your ideal life. Get a job do something fun, build financial independence. I don't care. Like that's what lights me up is helping people make progress. Well, Alan, Simon, I think it's been a huge, huge delight to have you here to talk with you guys, to know more about the whole real experience, the journey. I have the last Marvel metaverse. What if question? And that is, one is if you if Rebel Business School didn't exist in another metaverse, what will be Alan Donegan and Simon Payne doing? I love that. Obviously, I love a Marvel question and the multiverse. <laughs> uh, in a different multiverse, what would you have been, Simon Payne? What would you have been? Would you have been the rock star that you tried to be? Would you have remained a police 
detective inspector, would you have become a fat man with bald head in a BMW? I'll have you know I've got an excellent head of hair, Alan. Thank you for saying it's that. It's true. And you do look like Hawkeye. You look like Jeremy Renner. It's for anyone who's never seen Simon. That's what they'd be in the surprisingly. I... Yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd go with a Jeremy Renner. I, I don't know, Alan. I think there's... Um, that's really... I just love that question. I, I haven't quite given up on my rock star dreams yet, everybody. So who knows? Like, maybe maybe when I get into my next decade, I might uh, realise those music ambitions. Maybe I'll do something else. Um, but I think probably my best guess would be an international man of mystery. No. How about you, Alan? That's a rubbish How answer. How about you? Uh, <laughs> I think I very closely, like, I nearly followed the path of becoming a stand-up comedian. I very closely followed that until I realised I would have to be out delivering stand-up comedy every night and not seeing my wife anymore. So I think in an alternate universe, maybe I, I don't know, maybe I wouldn't have met Katie and I would have ended up a stand-up comedian. Mm-hmm. Um, in an alternate universe, you want the craziest moments the the alternate universe is that person wouldn't have given me the self-development book at 21 and i would have just followed jobs and been lost like there's those moments in your world that change your direction and for me like Mm -hmm. it was the book it was deciding not to be a stand-up comedian because i valued time with my wife more than that part and I could earn decent money doing the presentation skills stuff. And I think there's so there are, there is a multiverse in any one of us. And I, my closing thought to the audience would be you can take control of your multiverse at any point from this point on, you can change timelines. <laughs> you can change directions. You can learn a new skill. You can do new things. You can go in a new direction. So never feel trapped on the timeline you're in. Mm-hmm. Any timeline is possible for you if you commit, learn, grow, change, move, and take action. Wow. I'm going to live with that thought, Alan. Change the timeline. It's possible. Danny, thank you so much for taking over the Rebel Entrepreneur podcast. It's been fabulous having you on here and leading us through. I've loved your questions. Uh, For everyone listening, there is a second episode coming up that will be Simon and I talking to Danny about how he's built Rebel Columbia what the problems are, what the challenges are, what the rock roller coaster is, and there will be some incredible lessons in there for you. I would also like to thank Simon Payne for coming back on the show. He's been a pain in my side for years. Can't get rid of him, but You're I welcome. love him that way. Yes. Ah, uh, there's no getting rid of me, sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, So please take the energy from the podcast, take what we've talked about today, go have fun, build your business, make progress, and if you want to, lead a different timeline. You can have any life you want to. Choose to build something cool. Choose to take action. Choose to work to make your dreams become reality. Stand out. Be different. Be yourself. Be a rebel entrepreneur.